These kind of things needed to be programmed into muscle memory because we know that when you are under significant stress and we were training these medics to go into combat environments. This was towards the end of our selection course in a phase called Lucky Dip. When I looked around the gloom as the sun was setting on that particular day, there was a range of people inside that truck that were grossly and profoundly disappointed with the fact that their mind and body layer weren't connected. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is in my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your house. That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where you know you were going to funerals quite Do often. Do I leave under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. To be resilient to get a poke War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. You should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Welcome to Life on the Line. In this special episode, I speak with three previous guests of the show, Dr. Dan Pronk, Van Pronk DSC, and Tim Curtis. These three Special Forces veterans have told their stories before, in multiple episodes in Seasons 2, 3, and 4, details of which are on our website and in the episode description. In brief, Dan is a former combat doctor who served with the SAS and 2nd Commando Regiment in Afghanistan over four tours. His older brother, Ben, had multiple deployments of his own, from Timor-Leste to Afghanistan, including the original 2002 SAS deployment, before finishing his army career as the commanding officer of the SAS. Tim was a squadron commander in the SAS. He was personally selected to raise the East Coast counter-terrorist capability in 2002, and led the operation to seize the North Korean drug vessel MV Pong Su. These three Special Forces veterans have gone on to highly successful post-military careers in corporate leadership and crisis management, medicine, and even television. Dan is gracing our TV screens this year as the Doctor on SAS Australia, and Ben and Tim co-run Metal Global and co-host the Unforgiving 60 podcast. The trio have joined forces to write a book on resilience called The Resilient Shield. In the words of Dr. Richard Harris, one of the heroes of the Thai Cave Rescue, this book is, quote, a powerful text that will benefit any reader. It explores the hard-won resilient secrets of elite soldiers and the latest thinking on mental and physical well-being, equipping the reader with an arsenal of practical tools to master mindset and overcome adversity. I invited the three authors back on the podcast to talk about their book. The Resilient Shield is published by Pam McMillan, and I'm their editor. I'm Alex Lloyd, joined by three veterans turned authors to talk more about SAS resilience secrets. We're having a Zoom conversation across three time zones with me and Sydney. I'm joined from Adelaide by Dr. Dan Pronk. G'day, Dan. G'day, Alex. Next in Perth is Ben Pronk. Hi, Ben. Hey, Alex. How are you? Good. Thank you, mate. And with Ben in the studio, of course, is Tim Curtis. Hello, Tim. Hi, Alex. So, gents, we're chatting today to promote the Resilient Shield. Before we get into the book and some of the many stories you share in it, let's go back to this buzzword, resilience, and how the project started. Dan, what first got you and your co-authors here thinking about the concept of resilience and how to build it? I think it's been in the pipeline for some time, years now. Alex, I think the key thing for me that got me interested was when I discharged from the military. It was a big transition as it is for anyone, anyone making a big life change, but anyone who's who's discharging particularly from a military environment. And I just found that I, I started to struggle a little bit when I left that environment and, and some of the cumulative trauma of things that I'd experienced during the military that hadn't affected me greatly at the time started to catch up with me a little bit. And it just seemed a bit paradoxical that I'd never been safer before. I was in a steady job, had a good family, was very safe at home and earning more money than I ever had before. And and yet uh, I was, from a mental health perspective, I I was a bit worse off than I had been when I was in the high threat environments. And so it it just got me thinking what was going on there from a a psychological and a physiological perspective, looking at that, that paradox of sorts that I was managing to maintain a relatively high level of functioning in a high stress environment within the the military 
And then when I got out, it was only then that the, the stress sort of started to catch up with me a little bit. And so I started to look at the, the factors that were in play when I was with the military that were bolstering uh, not just mine, but all of our resilience when we were doing rotations, combat operations in places like Afghanistan, looking at those factors and just what I had lost when I transitioned out of there with a view to starting to try and rebuild that. And along that uh, journey, if you like, uh, sort of started linking up with Ben and Tim on their thoughts on the same thing, and that was the genesis of the Resilient Shield project. Well, Ben, the book's prologue opens in Afghanistan 2008 in a convoy ambush you're involved in, but this isn't an anecdote that says, here I was in the dash, knee-deep in grenade pins, saving the day, look how resilient I was. It's a bit deeper than that, and which sort of goes to the emotion of what Dan was just describing then. Why open the book with this particular vignette? Can you recount it for listeners, what the anecdote is and what it speaks to about resilience? The anecdote talks about a convoy ambush, as you mentioned, an IED attack on our vehicle convoy on what turned out to be the last patrol of of, uh, what ended up being my last major rotation in Afghanistan. The reason I chose to to recount it sort of without all the daring do is mainly because I spent most of that time in the fetal position sobbing, so I can't, I can't big myself up too much. But the, the real impact on me from that event was not so much the actual uh, IED explosion or the, the aftermath, but really the, the markedly different reactions the different people in that squadron group had to it. You know, there were people who were almost elated by this. They were really on top of their game. They seemed to be performing to a much higher level precisely because of the chaos that, that this had thrown us into. There are a lot of people, probably the majority, who were doing their job, going through as they'd been trained and almost unaffected. And there were some people who were really impacted by the trauma. And it sort of served as one of these real, uh, I guess, catalytic moments for our development of this model, looking at the different reactions that people had in the moment to to high stress environments, but also longitudinally as they progressed out of it. There were a whole bunch of different reactions from what was ostensibly a very similar group of people, in our case, SAS operators. And to Dan's point, you know, we kind of thought we were physically tough. We kind of thought we were mentally robust. I mean, you had to be to get into the unit in the first place. And so it spiked our interest in this concept of resilience and really drove us to look at, well, it's got to be something more than just the physical and mental aspects. There has to be a bunch of different layers at play in in terms of your own resilience. And to, I guess, close in on Dan's opening conversation, that was about the time we started talking with one another about, well, exactly what is this concept of resilience made up of? But there we see that, Ben, you're describing a test of resilience, say, in that Afghanistan convoy ambush situation. And then Dan's describing actually how he felt his own metal being tested when he was back home and safe. And so although we've just talked about that convoy ambush and it's a, you know, shiny action-packed example, it's a situation and environment the average reader, the average Australian will never find themselves in. But then you take that example and quickly pivot it to being a book for everyone. The average resilience requirements only differ by degree, not kind. Yeah, and I think that was a really important part of what we wanted to cover within this model. As you've alluded to, we recognise that resilience could be both physical and psychological, and it could be both acute and chronic. We could have these stressors playing on us that demand resilience in the moment uh, for that, that couple of hours of that convoy ambush, for example, or we might have resilience requirements that extend over 6, 12, 24 months, as, as Dan alluded to in his transition out of the military. And we also recognise that every individual is going to have a different baseline, either sort of genetically or, or that they've developed through their own experiences. And so it was really important to us that whatever model we came up with accounted for both the chronic and acute stressors and the requirement for resilience in those contexts, but also for a whole range of different individuals. And to your point, what we did discover is that exactly as you said, the resilience requirements of special operations soldiers versus Olympic athletes versus stockbrokers versus teachers versus students are essentially the same concepts. They differ in degree. Well, Tim, the book promises to demystify and define resilience in its blurb. So before we talk about how to build resilience and build those layers that have been alluded to, What is resilience? This is a definition that we struggled with. We were trying to work out for quite some time whether resilience is something you had coming into a stress event or something you got by successfully navigating that stress event. And we realized even in the literature, the definitions were very unclear. It was a bit from column A and a bit from column B. But ultimately, 
in order to have resilience, you must confront some form of adversity. So that's a basic underlying principle of our definition that you have to have a stressor in your life. It doesn't necessarily need to be something that's profound and acute. It could be chronic and or it could be chronic plus acute. So that really arrived us at our definition of resilience in that there were many factors to it, that it was modifiable and also dynamic. You could be more or less resilient depending on what you were confronting in any one given day. But you could take actions to either improve your resilience or decrease your vulnerability. And perhaps we'll dwell back on that in a little while. I think the other really interesting thing which didn't come to us immediately but was certainly highlighted by our amazing research partner in at the University of uh, Western Australia, Dr. Lise Notabart, is that resilience is relative. It's got to be taken in conjunction with the stressors that you're facing. That, I think, took us a while to get our heads around. We were initially thinking of working definitions of resilience as, you know, going, uh, coming out of an event as good as or better than you went in. But Lise highlighted that if that event was a bushfire that's killed your family, destroyed your house, ruined your livelihood and left you with third degree burns all over your body, then it's probably a bit of a stretch to say you've come out of it better than you went in. But your reaction, if it's better than expected or better than average, uh, given those stressors faced, that starts to get closer to, to a real uh, usable working definition of resilience. A lot of people listening to this podcast, and I'll wear the responsibility for this definition, but a lot of people listening might pay, say be Jocko Willing fans, and they might have read some of his books on leadership, and I have always described your book as smart Jocko. That's not an insult to Jocko, <laughs> but I've just um, it's particularly <laughs> cerebral and considered and backed, and we'll get to some of the science and the academia you've alluded to later, but you take the time to define resilience, you take the time to explain it's a complex world that we live in, full of stressors, and you even also paint very clearly the balancing scales of resilience and stress. It's not binary. You're not resilient or stressed, but you are actually resilient in the face of stressors. And it's only when one of those outweigh the other negatively that you can be negatively affected. And it's probably important to dwell on the word stress. We recognize that in order to be optimized, so the literature tells us we actually need stress in our life. And that's one thing that that we omit when we have discussions about stress in our own communities. So the two academics who came up with the performance stress scale, Yerkes and Dodson, indicated that there is an optimum stress band. And for all the listeners, they would recognize that the time that they performed best at something in their life, there'll generally be some stressor involved. So we challenge people in the early parts of the book to rethink about the word stress to really look for how can I make sure that I'm in that optimum stress band in order to be the best version of myself that I possibly can be. So Dan, let's come to the resilient shield model itself. What is this shield and how does it make us resilient? The idea of the shield when we started to look at resilience and take that deep dive and that was both from a, a personal perspective in terms of our own experiences and and where we had thrived in the face of adversity and maybe not done as well observations of those around us in the military environment and in life in general that had thrived in the face of adversity or not and also from a, a scientific perspective starting to look at what studies had been done into resilience and as uh, tim mentioned earlier the the literature is divided in to their definition of resilience and what that looks like. But there's certainly a whole bunch of resilience studies. Uh, there's In the last 20 years, there's been an exponential increase in those studies, real interest in the area. And so there's a lot of data that looks at individual aspects of, an, of, a, of a person. So they're things like their genetic makeup, their innate kind of factors that are correlative or causative of resilience. And, and then there, there was a whole bunch of other things like physical fitness, like your job competence, like your values, like your optimism. There was all these different studies that looked at one aspect and mapped it against resilience. And, and we started to realize that a bunch of these studies fit neatly into layers. And so when we started developing our model, we used a shield and we talked to that in the book why we use that, but it fits well, relevant to, to resilience, a shield there. But we started to realize that we could relatively neatly categorize these different facets of resilience into these layers, but acknowledging that they are not independent. You can break them down for study purposes and analyze them independently, but they all overlap one another. They're all interwoven. 
So we started to make this model looking at the individual shields, so the innate layer, your nature and nurture, your genetics and epigenetics. We know that that's a factor. Things like your personality, your values, those kind of things. The mind layer is uh, is certainly very, very uh, correlated to resilience, your, your mental strength and spirituality and other mental aspects, meditation practices, these kind of things. Your body layer, your health and fitness maps against it. Your social layer, we know the stronger your social network, the more resilient you are, which makes sense. You've got people around around you to help you through stressful situations, professional layer. And and then around the outside of it all, we placed what we call adaptation, which grows with development of each of the layers of your shield. And that's fundamentally your ability to be resilient against a novel stress or so something you haven't seen before, haven't had the opportunity to train for. If you've built up those individual layers and you're strong across your shield, you'll have this strong adaptive layer as well. So, and as I said, they all do overlap, particularly mind and body, but um, we just treated them in those different layers with the goal of being able to then deconstruct and really get down to a granular level on what you can be doing minute to minute, day to day, week to week to build up those layers, which then builds up your overall resilient shield. So the goal was to deconstruct it into layers so we could get to that granular level so you can work on the individual layers with the overall result of of building this overall resilient so you've described six layers there and we'll walk through what they are and some of those stories from that as well so listeners can get a taste of what they'll read in the resilient shield before they go out and buy a copy dan you mentioned there that those layers are indeed interwoven and one of the great metaphors early on to describe that is the strength of the weave in afghan carpets on chicken street was that you or ben who was walking through by new rug for your living room no that was ben yeah Jen, or was it tim yeah it wasn't me generally i was, uh, was, tim, I was yeah. out doing my job and not not out shopping but i'm <laughs> Mate, as, as you say that i'm looking in the background of your shrine to self i think the biggest thing you did in afghan was souvenir stuff there's more artifacts behind yeah you, yeah you're probably right you got me there Anyway, it was the it was the Chicken Street story. It was Tim. So Tim, tell me about your time on Chicken Street. Yeah, so Chicken Street is a street in Kabul in the capital of Afghanistan and peculiarly you can't buy chickens there. It's a absolute mercantile hurricane. The street is tiny and as a foreigner, as you walk up the street, the various vendors will crowd you and it, it can actually be a very intimidating place. But one way you can overcome that intimidation is to slip into one of the many carpet shops where from floor to roof, absolutely thousands of carpets exist. And And the first time you ever walk into the shop, you get offered green tea, this Afghan loose leaf tea and sugar, which is liberally dosed into your cup of tea. And if you don't like sugar, you just don't stir the cup. To a foreigner, you're always captivated by the colours and geometry on the carpet. You know, you'll point to the carpets that you really love and the carpet seller and their assistant will drag it down and in broken English or the little dari or pashtun that you might know, you'll start communicating and haggling on the price. And whilst we always look at the top side of the carpet as being the place where you would derive its value, the carpet seller continually turns the carpet upside down because it's the knots per square inch that define an Afghan carpet carpet's value. And we thought, you know what, that's a really interesting way of thinking about resilience. Dan had talked about the relationship of each of the different layers, but also our iconography being a shield. Now, a shield and its layers is not a true way to describe resilience, but rather if you zoomed right in on the shield, a bit like you'd get in a carpet or a piece of Kevlar, you'd see all of these individual little strands of resilience that either knot nice and tightly together or not. And so we talk in the book about the importance of that, recognizing that you can't isolate a level. You can't say, I'm doing enough in one of those levels so I can just trade out and not do anything in the other level because at a really micro level, that will have a profound difference on your resilience. So, Tim, you were browsing through Chicken Street, I assume, in 2005 when you consulted to the UN during the Afghan parliamentary elections. Did you end up buying a carpet with a particularly good weave? Yeah, we actually have many of them, some that are in my house on the lounge room floor, and it's about 10% of what you'd buy um, a carpet for on Chicken Street to what you'd pay in Manhattan in New York. We also have one sitting right next to us on the floor of the office. So, yeah, we have quite a few. 
Well, let's stick with you, Tim, and we're going to start walking through the layers of the shield. So, Tim, can you walk us through the innate layer? Yeah, so it's a recognition that whoever we are, we have some level of resilience that we bring to anything right now. There is some evidence in the literature that actually that's coded in our genetics or our DNA. And so some of that's inherited, but also some of that is the way that we were brought up, the interactions that we had with people and or loved ones, and the sorts of things that we did in our life. And then next is the mind layer. Ben, can you tell us more about that and how important this is to resilience? The mind layer is so important that it actually broke our research model. One of the the big, I guess the most important things to us about this model was that we wanted it to be scientifically validated fine for us to say we saw these things in Afghanistan or we've seen our mates have issues or we've we've anecdotally experienced these different sort of reactions to stress but it was critical to us that we had the scientific validation not just through our literature review but also through our own research and so we developed a survey which used a bunch of existing peer-reviewed screens as proxies for each of our layers and we went into this with a hypothesis that we reckon there's these layers to the resilient shield and we reckon they all contribute and we sort of think they probably contribute about the same amount. We were right on the first two counts, but we were very wrong on the last count. The mind layer contributes significant amounts to your resilience, such that the the measures we were using statistically essentially correlated perfectly with the measure we were using for global resilience. So our statistical model thought that resilience was just the mind layer, the way we were recording it at that time. The upshot of that is, is that it is very important. And we've seen throughout history examples of this, people like uh, Nelson Mandela, incarcerated for 27 years, a guy called James Bond Stockdale, a North Ameri- uh, an American fighter pilot shot down over North Vietnam during the war and spent four years in the Hanoi Hilton. They were not getting the best sleep diet exercise. Their body layer was suffering. Uh, I can't imagine their social layer would have been too rocking. And uh, professionally, they were, were not doing much while incarcerated. And yet, we're able to maintain a, a level of resilience going through. So I think that anecdotally speaks to what our research has proven, that the, the mind layer is absolutely critical. In terms of what's in it, basically anything that's to do with the, the psychology. So your mindset, your approach. Dan mentioned the word spirituality before, which we love. So that can include formal religion, but it can also include just an awareness of things around you. So practices like wabi-sabi, the Japanese art of, of seeing beauty and imperfect things, certainly things like mindfulness and meditation are massive contributors to the mind layer and our, our statistics, our survey uh, reinforces that. And then finally, things like gratitude, the ability to recognize how good you've got it, recognize the the good things in your life and uh, mentally acknowledge those. All of these move the needle on the mind layer, which, as I said before, is the most important component of our resilience. There's an interesting practical proof on this too, isn't there, Dan, Ben? So we all did a a selection course, uh, SA selection course, and we've instructed on numerous others. And one of the things that we did become fascinated with is the 100 plus people that you line up with on day one. Some of them are incredible physical specimens, but they're gone by day three. So... We really played with our model in thinking about, well, what's the difference between fitness and toughness? And the mind component is is one key driver there. I think your answers there also illustrate how this book has been written in that it's deeply researched, it's lived experience, and then it's also backed up by vignettes, anecdotes from your lives and lives of other people. And so take the mind layer chapter without spoiling anything. You know, there's vignettes in there, including of how mindfulness can be used to stay composed during a crashing helicopter, how the mind can be used to force an exhausted body to keep going, whether we're talking CrossFit to yes, SAS selection, or how even brief lapses in mindfulness can lead to some career ending scenario and then you equip the reader with techniques, those techniques for like meditation, mindfulness, breathing, and others of how to better foster that. Well, you mentioned there, Tim, SAS selection. One of my favorite stories in the book for its humor is in this chapter told by Ben from his SAS selection story, the story of a bloke we'll call Kiwi. Can you share that one with us, Ben? This was towards the end of our selection course in a phase called Lucky Dip, which is kind of the keynote sort of final component. It's a, a small team uh, activity which is generally characterized by long periods of carrying heavy stuff and uh, some food and sleep deprivation thrown in 
In this particular scenario, we were moving a, um, <laughs> a collection of sandbags, which was referred to as Trooper Sandy, so a supposedly injured comrade, moving him over a mountain range towards a, a hospital, which was apparently always over the next ridgeline, and, and of course we, we never actually found. And we had been given for that sort of five odd days of that period we'd been given a couple of live chickens as our only rations for the the period and we, we had them tucked into our packs along with you know the the various stores we were carrying and and of course the stretcher with trooper sandy on it and as we moved up this particular hill which was fairly back breaking you know things were jostling around and um the directing staff who were running this exercise were playing the role of an indigenous uh, guerrilla group they were using just dreadful non-specific accents to to sort of add credibility to this and the only thing we could really work out for sure was that they worshipped chickens that chickens in their society were, were absolutely demigods and so every time a chicken squawked or appeared to be in some kind of distress in the back of our packs they made us pray to the local chicken god in a movement that, that was very reminiscent of a burpee and so we were moving up and down this hill and every time a chicken had squawked we'd get sent to the bottom of the hill and and clearly this was was going to go on forever or or at least the the foreseeable future Kiwi, our section mate, was an absolute monster, real physically fit guy, lovely bloke. Everyone was sure that he'd, he'd get through. There was no doubt he was just, um, had the, the physical goods, had the temperament and the character. But for some reason, this, this one sort of event was getting to him and he just couldn't get it through his head that this was all part of the game. We just had to keep going and he, he kept trying to get people to sort of move the chickens so they wouldn't squawk or to shut the chickens up or to, you know, sort of put them at the back or whatever. And, and of course, nothing nothing uh, worked. And uh, eventually we sort of <laughs> saw Kiwi starting to, to get more and more emotional. And so we, we moved him away from the chickens up the front of the group. And he was really distraught and, and basically just kept walking uh, over the top of the hill, even, even after we'd stopped. And uh, I never saw Kiwi again. <laughs> I saw an ambulance sort of crest the hill and go after him and I assume uh, it took him away. The point that it sort of raised, again, to, to your point about the, the strength of the mind, this was a guy who was, was absolutely physically dominating this course, really doing well, but just that one little, uh, I guess, chink in the metal armour meant that he, he was unable to successfully complete it. Well, moving along, the doctor in the house, how important is the body layer to this model? Yeah, hugely important. I think it won't come as any surprise to listeners that your physical, the better your health and your fitness, the more resilient you are. I mean, the health and fitness are both really strongly correlated to resilience. It makes sense. What we aim to do with the body layer, though, was rather than just be prescriptive saying, you know, all the stuff that the listeners will know, you know, sleep well, eat well, do lots of exercise and these sort of things that we all know this. What we wanted to do, though, was try and distill that down into, well, what does that mean? And for the for everyone who's busy, time poor, how do you optimise the body layer? Uh, look at some of the finer detail around things like sleep, and we talk about blue light exposure. Try and just have a, a little bit around the gut microbiome, and just things that um, people might not necessarily know as much about that are that are relatively, in the grand scheme, cheap and easy, quick hacks to optimise your your body layer. And so that's basically the emphasis of the the body layer in the book. Look looking at, at different exercise regimes and, and once again directed at the time poor looking at things like high intensity interval training and how that relates to the overall benefits and reduction in all cause morbidity and mortality improvements in your health when compared to things like longer slower cardio a lot of the government's health policies around exercise look at, at doing 90 minutes a few times a week and these kind of things you know these numbers that that for a busy professional may not be practical and so we distill that right down and look for the really low-hanging fruit, if you like, in optimising your, your health and fitness and then building from there. And everyone is going to be different, as we've alluded to a couple of times. We're all starting from different points. We've all got different interests. We've all got different physical capabilities. This book's designed to be applicable to a, a broad range of ages, and it just looks at broad brush how you can optimise those individual components of the body layer. And, and we, we talked to it a little bit in the book, but we're starting to get some really interesting results 
results with the data that we're getting back and with the processing of that data and just looking down once again at a granular level within the body layer as to what actually moves the needle more than other things when we look at things like diet, exercise, sleep, body mass index, we're getting some really interesting data back there. So not only are we looking at the resilient shield as a model and which layers, as Ben said, like the mind layer is we're seeing exponentially more important than some of the others, but within the layer, we can start to see which factors that make up just that one layer are more important than the others as well. And that's the, the design of the, that uh, research project is to get that, that real detail so that people who are busy, time poor, can work out the exact things that they can be doing to optimise their resilience in terms of limited time input. Yes, because it's all very well and good when other books might say, look, if you can find an hour to meditate, you can definitely find an hour and then you do this excellent meal prep and you go for a long run and it's like, yeah, great, when do I fit that into my life? So it's um, an important point there that you've drawn. The three of you have busy professional lives and later Tim offers his perfectly aspirational day. Not every day is going to be a perfect day. You achieve these things, but these little quick hacks, quick tricks are things that you can build into your life to be sustainable and then repeatable And because it's that sustainability that creates discipline, which creates change, it's key. Yeah, and it's also critical that we had a model that could be tailored for every individual. Um, a lot of the products out there we see that talk about resilience are basically sort of one size fits all. You should meditate more or you should eat better or you should get fitter or you should spend more time with friends. All of those are true to a greater or lesser extent, but if I'm an Ironman triathlete or a, a professional sports player, you know, perhaps my sleep diet and exercise are dialed, I'm going to get only marginal improvements by spending a lot of time in that area. And this is why to us it was critical that we had that multifactorial model, but also we gave our readers a tool that they could assess where their, their start point was. And of course, that's the resilience survey, which provides you an understanding of your relative strengths and weaknesses as it appears. Uh, applies to the resilient shield model so you can spend that limited time working on areas that are really going to have a, a, a move the needle what is the data showing dan that's the most important component of the body layer is it sleep yeah it is yeah so sleep is is really being highlighted as a, a, a critical area and we talk to the literature on sleep and, and chronic sleep deprivation in the book and the reality is as we've gone along in the last hundred years our average sleep across the board is dropping off and is a couple of hours less on average per night than it was 50 odd years ago and so we're getting busier and busier as we go along and there more and more inputs but getting less and less sleep and sleep's a, an interesting beast in itself in that it's we've only just really started to work out from a scientific perspective in the last 50, 60 years, what it actually is and why it's so important. And with the evolution of our abilities to look at brains, both from a brain wave perspective and from a, a scanning perspective, a functional MRI perspective, particularly where we can look at what brains are doing during different states, starting to be able to track sleep patterns. We know that sleep, you oscillate through different stages of sleep. There's the light sleep, the rapid eye movement, the deeper stages of sleep, and they all have different functions. And so we're starting to to be able to work out what it's all about and what happens during these different stages and also the implications which are significant across a whole range of human performance of sleep deprivation, both acute sleep depth where you don't, uh, you know, you stay awake for days and days at a time, which they use to great effect on courses like essay selection and also in a interrogation, uh, military and government organisations know that sleep deprivation is a good way to grind a person down. And we look at, at so acute sleep deprivation, but, but the chronic sleep deprivation, which most people who are busy in modern day and age are probably accumulating chronic sleep deprivation and sleep debt. And there's a bunch of fairly interesting studies that look at, at how that affects human performance, physical but more so cognitive. It really is when you look within the body layer, the most significant that, that is correlated against resilience from our data and starts to just allow you to, to think, say, for instance, a, a professional athlete who's getting up at, at 5 a.m. every morning to go and train. It may be that with some of these people, they're better off foregoing one of their body layer activities being a training session to get that extra bit of sleep. And, and so these are the things that we're starting to get the detail on from the survey to be able to to, you know, once again, just optimise that resilience and look at how you trade off the different layers to optimise your own individual resilience. The other really interesting thing that it talks to is this tension between generalisation and specialisation. And 
we are offering in our book that uh, specialization of any kind may actually come at a cost to generalize global resilience. And certainly from our own experiences, that's probably what we saw a little bit with uh, some of our colleagues in the SAS who were heavily invested in their professional layer. So a lot of their lives were rotated around work, particularly when we were campaigning in Afghanistan over that decade plus period. They were probably pretty good in the body layer, but maybe neglecting areas of their social layer, potentially neglecting areas of their mind's layer in terms of mindfulness, gratitude, and these kind of practices. And in some cases, that's been to the detriment of them in the long run. Likewise, Olympic athletes, you know, any sort of high-powered business professionals, what we're hoping our model can help make them aware of is that while you can specialise and you may need to search for a certain requirement, don't do it at the neglect of these other aspects of your life that you are going to need in that that sense of global resilience further down the track. And so it is trying to build back in a, a bit of balance. And Tim mentioned before, it was important to us that the model was dynamic, that it could ebb and flow with the demands of your life. And so, yeah, maybe you are surging at work for a period, but hopefully the, the model reminds you that if you do that for the rest of your life, then you are leaving that big chink in your armour, in your shield, that life can eventually find that funny way of, of getting through. And I think a useful analogy, just to jump in there quickly to add to Ben, is a diversified share portfolio. I think most people understand that as a concept. If you, you, know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket financially, and it's no different with your resilience. If you're heavily invested and you're generating and drawing most of your resilience from one or two layers, and then fate intervenes and takes that away from you, then you don't have anything to fall back on. So it's like having all your money in one share and if that share is going well, then you're rich. Uh, same with resilience. If you're going well professionally, if you're a, a professional or from a physical perspective as a sporting person, then that's great, you're resilient. But if you injure yourself as a sports person or you get made redundant as a professional, if you don't have that diversified resilience portfolio, you don't have much to fall back on and you're likely to fall in a heap. And that covers well how... You look at the granular on something, and I'm using sleep as an example of one of the many body layer components here. If you look at the granular, then you can then zoom out again and look at that dynamic, how the components are interwoven and how you must adjust those different dials depending on your specific circumstances. And then the book comes with, the, like you alluded to earlier, Dan, those practical applications. The answer is not just, okay, sleep's very important. Here's anecdotes and evidence that shows that. Go get more sleep not that helpful you actually then talk about as you say and i'll leave the detail to the book but you talk about how to optimize that which is important for the average busy aussie uh the exception being for someone like a sydney cider in lockdown like myself i can just afford to sleep more that's been great i felt my physical resilience improving the past couple of weeks before we leave the body layer tim you share an anecdote in the body layer chapter where both your mind and body were in sync on sas selection which i think speaks to a little bit of the interwoven nature of the layers can you Briefly tell us how you went a little further that day. SA selection is full of these horrendous activities and this afternoon, in fact, this evening was no different. We'd just had a large dinner and had lined up for another activity and after a mandatory push-up punishment for factors that didn't really matter, we were told, put all of your combat equipment on, so 20-odd kilogram pack and 9-kilogram weapon and tactical webbing and start marching in lines, in files, in columns. And off we went at light infantry pace and to a moment, 25 minutes into this forced march, we were told by one of the directing staff, one of the instructors, right, go at your own pace. And there was no further information. There wasn't for the next X kilometres or for the next X minutes. Uh, and most in that formation maintained their pace. But I thought, oh, God, I've got to be right up the front here. So I started running. And there was a few, a little pocket of us that started to run there. And probably another 30 minutes into it, uh, trucks came up and started picking people up from the tail. And finally, they got to this little pocket of runners at the front of the group and hoovered us up as well. And I was quite disappointed that the truck had, had caught me. I certainly wasn't physically the fittest and certainly wasn't the best pack marcher. But the one thing that I experienced when I jumped into the truck is that when I looked around the gloom uh, as the sun was setting on that particular day, there was a range of people inside that truck that were grossly and profoundly disappointed with the fact that their mind and body layer weren't connected. And I took a lot of reassurance in that part of the course that oh, I've seen to have made that connection okay. 
Well, as has been pointed out in a previous podcast, you perversely enjoyed SAS selection, but we'll leave that there. (laughs) Staying with you though, Tim, the layers of the shield go more from internal, your mind, your body, all the self, to the external when we reach the social layer. Tell me about this one. Yeah, it's a recognition of the importance of social support systems, predominantly, but not necessarily always outside of your work environment. Uh, We start the this chapter with a little discussion uh, about my football club. About five years ago, I went back to playing Masters Australian Rules football because largely I'm a competitive being. I like kicking goals and tackling people. But it got to the end of that first, my first year at the club at a presentation night, a person stood up and said, this football club changed my life. And there was a litany of people who then followed that, a series of them saying that if it wasn't for this football club, I'd be dead. And so that got me thinking and I watched carefully over the next few years in in the footy club and realised that being part of that AFL Masters football club had nothing to do with the cowhide football. It was all about the social support network that was offered to these men over the age of 35. We talked to in this layer also the importance of solitude to be mindful for that mind layer but that you never want to drift from solitude into loneliness. U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murphy talks about loneliness being an epidemic and the physiological equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is fascinating and terrifying at the same time. And so we talk about not just the importance of a close circle of friends or a single but valued confidant, but the importance of being present when you're in those social settings. Two courses in particular that we apply from our SAS life. One is the tactical questioning course. How do I ask questions to elicit the best response from those that I'm with? And the second being the close personal protection course. How do I read body language to make sure that I am absolutely present in my own body language, but also they are drawing a good connection from me. And we tell a little bit about Dan's story of active listening um, in a situation where he was under incredible pressure, including having been on the clock at an emergency department for a prolonged period of time where active listening really saved, arguably saved the life of, of one of his patients. And one of the interesting things in the literature that we dwell upon is Harvard psychologist David McClelland, who talks about 95% of our success being associated with those that we hang around with, which is amazing, that the importance of social viscosity. So the social layer is about diminishing your vulnerability, less than creating greater resilience, but incredibly powerful layer. And the other thing that we're doing inside this layer is working out, well, how powerful. So our body of work with our research partner and specifically Dr. Lise Notabard at University of Western Australia, we are looking at how does social support systems fit certain demographics. Are girls better at this than guys? What about at different age brackets? And I'm really curious to see what what the results are of that. Yeah, the social layer chapter is packed with vignettes. Some are non-military related and we can just draw parallels ourselves from, say, the... uh, happy wanderer phase on SAS selection, being alone successfully and not being lonely to, as another SAS parallel, how to carefully select your patrol members. And then we move on from the social to the professional layer. Dan, how does our daily working life contribute to our resilience? I mean, it contributes hugely. Most of us will spend a massive chunk of our lives working, our adult lives working. And so if you're not getting that right, if that's adding to your stress rather than contributing to your resilience, then it's going to be uh, it's going to be causing problems and, and lots of people will have that. They'll, they'll have a lot of stress in their life from their work and, and we look at ways in that professional layer as to how you can, even within a stressful job, optimise your experience in that job. We look at things like your values and how your values relate to your role, how you can use a, a more of a uh, intrinsic sort of motivation in the workplace, create what's called flow in the workplace. So even the most menial of tasks, if you organise them in a certain fashion, you can get a, a better experience out of that. And so we, we look at the, the social piece, we look at things like training and building resilience against 
the stressors of the known stressors of your workplace and we talk to that from a, a military perspective and then how that applies to a, a broader construct and so certainly you're professional and and then there's the the psychological aspect of drawing some of your identity from your professional role as well and and we talked to that and that was a through social identity theory you become a member of, of an in group which is your work group and so part of that bolsters your personal identity and your personal resilience and and we talked to a case study of myself transitioning out of the military as we spoke about before when when I had a big change in my life and and just with hindsight uh, just acknowledging that I had invested so much in my professional identity and had become identity fused so my personal identity was pretty much overlapped with my work identity and just the the pitfalls of that of being highly invested in a in a professional role and then not knowing who you are really outside of that role which while you're in that role it goes okay but then if you have to move out of that role and this comes back to the discussion we were having earlier about that diversified resilience portfolio and making sure you're building all your layers I'd fallen into that trap of just being so invested professionally in that area that when I transitioned out I lost a lot of that resilience that had been just part of me being with the the military so look the the professional piece is is huge and that that's just the simple fact that we do spend so much of our working lives at work and just looking at like with the body layer the hacks if you like the the ways you can optimize that and some things that people may not be consciously recognizing they may know they have stress or friction at work but they may not know why just bringing that into the forefront and into focus and then looking at at ways on a once again uh, sort of minute to minute hour to hour day to day week to week time frame that you can be optimizing those factors within the workplace to be having a better experience and building your overall resilience there's an anecdote in this chapter dan where you're supervising the training of a special operations medic and it speaks to levels of conscious competence conscious incompetence etc can you talk a bit more on that yeah absolutely so what that's talking about it's looking at stages of skill acquisition and just getting to a a point known as unconscious competence where basically you've programmed a skill set into muscle memory it's happening without your executive function of your brain having to drive the movements and in this instance in the in the special operations medical environment or any military medical environment what we aim to achieve was train our medics to the point where they had all their core fundamental skill sets programmed into this unconscious competence, this muscle memory. And that was things like casualty assessments, putting on arterial tourniquets, packing wounds, establishing intravenous lines. These kind of things needed to be programmed into muscle memory because we know that when you are under significant stress and we were training these medics to go into combat environments and we we know that when anyone's under significant stress, their ability to, their bandwidth uh, shrinks right down and and so if anything if they're having to tie up their executive function and and all their higher mental functions on a particular task it means they don't have the ability to maintain situational awareness to be communicating to be switching tasks quickly They, they they put the blinkers on and they get honed in so you need all of that those core skill sets on muscle memory programmed into unconscious competence so that you can have that executive function and so the the vignette talks to our trick if you like to assess whether someone was unconsciously competent was you would have them doing a high fidelity scenario where they're going through their processes of treating a simulated casualty and then i would ask them for a thing called a nine liner which was the standard nato sequence report to, to launch a medical evacuation and so in that particular scenario the medic's doing his treatment from the outside it looks fantastic and then i asked him for the nine liner he stopped what he was doing and started telling me the nine liner and then I said well treat your casualty he went back to that stopped stopped telling me the nine liner so it was it was indicating to me that he needed that higher order executive function to be doing the physical tasks and he couldn't do the the physical tasks and tell me the nine liner at once so I could almost in effect switch him on and off and I could see that he hadn't yet programmed those skills and so it was just a bit of a tool that we used to assess where they were at in terms of that skill acquisition sequence and after a bit more training he was he was able to keep doing his skills and tell me the nine liner and that was when we were confident he had everything tied into his unconscious competence and he was ready to to uh, go and face a combat environment then ben this all culminates in the final layer the adaptation layer can you briefly cover that one for me so a lot of what we've spoken about is building up specific 
elements of your life, mind, body, social, professional. And Dan alluded to the fact that we can build up specific sort of domain specific resilience in different professional aspects. This final layer kind of brings it all together and it's a bit different from the others in that you can't necessarily work directly on it, but it gets developed by virtue of you you building up the other layers. And this is really trying to build a readiness or a resilience against the unknown and the unknowable. We like to think of it as what's going to protect you against the zombie apocalypse, your ability to have resilience across this whole range of different facets that allows you a baseline to defend against a, a novel stressor. And so there's actually some really interesting research on this. The concept of grit, which has been popularized by Angela Duckworth, talks to a facet of resilience. A lot of it's talking about a conscientiousness-based aspect of personality. But the ability to keep going in a certain domain has been demonstrated to be transferable to others. So people who stick with school, for example, are more likely to stick with a marriage. So there is elements of that transferability. And we think the same uh, exists in terms of global resilience, that if you are able to develop your shield to a point where you are uh, resilient against the stressors that you know about in your life, then we reckon you've got a better chance of surviving the zombie apocalypse. We've touched on this already in the chat, but you three share plenty of stories of your time in and out of uniform in the book and those of other military people, including former guests of this show and the Unforgiving 60, Matt Willie Williams and Monica Georgieva, but also civvies from Dr. Richard Harris to Emily Skye. Tim, why not just make this a pure SAS slash special forces slash knee deep in grenade pins, as Ben likes to say, book? It comes back to, I think, your very original question and point, Alex, that this is a topic that covers all industry, all sector, all age groups. It's as relevant to my 82-year-old father as my 15-year-old daughter. And the walks of life uh, applicability has been a critical component of it. And so what we didn't want to say to once again requote something that Ben said is, hey, we we're once in the SAS and therefore we're resilient, so therefore you should just be like us. We wanted to make sure that this was evidence-based and that there were an applied and practical models, things that you could do, a toolkit that you could use in your own life, in your own sort of unique and specific way. So that was that was really important and we've we've seized on the opportunity to do that with those people who inspire us, who will be recognizable by anyone who reads the book. And we think that brings a really rich tapestry to it, that you get a variety of different stories about people who have done incredible things and or confronted incredible things but got through them. That was really important to us. I think the other really critical factor is we never wanted to suggest that the the SAS had all the secrets when it came to resilience. I mean, I think there's a lot of good stuff that the unit and units like it have developed over sort of the last half century in terms of facing stressors and and coming out the other end. But uh, as Dan mentioned before, a lot of our friends have have had impacts and stress-related illness of one form or another. I think you could even look at the, the current IGADF investigations and some of the allegations caught up in there as more a sort of question as to the, the fact that everyone does have a limit and that even people who are specially selected to operate in high stress environments do have a, a point where their resilience breaks down. And so that was a big part for us. That it wasn't uh, so much going in as we've got all the answers, but as going in as we started this conversation by saying, well, we've got a whole bunch of questions. We've seen a lot of interesting stuff. We've experienced a lot of it. Some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't. And that was really the genesis for us to develop this model and to continue interrogating it throughout our research. And you've both covered there and previously that it's also based academically. So it's a very well-rounded book in that regard. You guys do corporate talks, podcasts, and more. Dan, what inspired putting fingers to keyboard and for the three of you to join forces and to write a book? You've talked about what prompted the investigation of resilience as a concept. And I've heard you speak about it to various degrees before in other contexts, but actually then the proverbial putting pen to paper. What brought that about? For years now, I've enjoyed the writing process, the journaling process. I, I know we've spoken before, Alex, on on the uh, podcast about the act of writing as a way of processing some of the events that happened in Afghanistan, which was recommended to me by one of the psychologists in a, a post-appointment brief in 2011, just to try and kind of codify and make sense of and, and organise thoughts in my mind. I found writing that down helped and then started writing a bit more, journaling, blogging a, a little bit. So I enjoy the process. 
process for a start. But when we started to develop this and started to engage with various groups, as you said, with talks and workshops and those sort of things around resilience and started to come together as the the three of us to develop these ideas, we looked at the book as as more of a way to just formalise all of this, to get these thoughts down on paper and, and just force us in a way to really develop this model. So we we needed to really get it down and get it sort of honed in, get it on paper and work out what we were trying to say, which was a, has been in development over, over years, which then fueled the need to go back to the literature. And so it was sort of this, just a good focus to have. And then when you've got the gun to your head with um, an angry editor making you have your drafts in on time, <laughs> it, you just, I guess it's human nature and we're not immune to it, to procrastinate. And so that was just another fantastic way. And I mean, it was a real privilege to to be able to get a, a book deal for it, but then that put a, a timeline on it. And, you know, every smart goal needs to be time bound. And so that was a, a, a way to force the development of the model, to build the book, to further the research, to be able to help with the, the research project. And, and so it was all a, a big sort of uh, upward spiral, if you like. As we went along, we realised we needed to formalise this thing and then it made too much sense to write a book and, and then we did. Well, you not only met your contracted delivery date, but every other deadline thereafter. So whether that's an editor holding a gun to your head or just you three being very punctual and reliable authors, I'll leave that up to the listener to determine. A question for all three of you then, how did you find the writing process of co-authoring a book? Was it indeed a great test of your own resilience? There's an old saying, never go into business with a friend or family. I, I could definitely uh, say that extends to writing a book as well. And we, I think we started off, uh, as Dan mentioned, you know, there was a, a little bit of time pressure to, to get this thing together. Neither or none of us are, are sort of, uh, I guess, shrinking violets when it comes to having an opinion about something. And, and so I think the first couple of uh, sessions as we started bringing these threads together we we risked letting our egos get ahead of us and and sort of wanting to have the last word but I think very quickly we we had a bit of an epiphany that there was no point a writing this if it was going to sort of blow up our relationship and b we we're writing this thing about resilience and you know working together and putting ego aside and being a bigger person and, and we're having these little chest puffing conversations about whether it should be happy or glad in sentence three and so i think we we woke up to ourselves pretty quickly and it ended up being a ton of work but actually a pretty enjoyable process. Yeah, certainly from from my perspective, it's thoroughly enjoyable. I think the three of us are probably wired pretty similarly and, and exactly as Ben said at the start, we were probably all pretty confident that our opinion was the, the correct one, but um, it did go along really smoothly. And the thing that really hit home to me was I had in my mind how I thought the various chapters should go. And then there was often times where Ben and Tim had come forward with stuff that was completely outside of anything I could have possibly thought about. And so I got all these opinions and which just added to the breadth of the book. And, and also I think I'm a bit prone to over uh, being a bit over scientific and <laughs> too many references and too many big wanky doctor words. I remember your first draft. Yep. Yeah. So I think I was a bit stuck in the um, kind of scientific writing uni type uh, mindset there. And, and so it was good to work with a couple of simple knuckle draggers to be able to just sort of take take the edge off my academia. Well, you wait till the audio book comes out and how badly I've pronounced some of those medical terms, Dan. It was excellent, though. In, in one of the early drafts, I remember correcting the phrase ambulatory incapacitation or something, and I said, mate, we're, we're writing this for the every person. Why don't we just say difficulty walking? Because <laughs> we have to justify our massive hex debts, which actually I never had. The, the army picked mine up. But, yeah, all those years at med school, you gotta you got to try and justify it. Tim, I assured the audio team that you all were so well read and qualified and brainy, you wouldn't need a pronunciation guide and knew all the words correctly. So if I'm going to be in trouble from them, that's a good heads up. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think I think we'll be in trouble. My Latin is not as good as perhaps it should be, and there were a, a bit. Of, it was a bit of soul searching for a couple of words there. In fact, um, just coming back to the pleasure it's been to write this book with Ben and Dan, and I'm very thankful that I was able to be part of the project. 
someone asked me through the writing process, oh, it must just be easy. There's three authors and you only have to write a third of the book. And we dawned on this realisation that, yeah, indeed, it's one third the effort, but triple the difficulty. But I think in in probably closing that out, it definitely has been triple the fun. It's been a, a lot of fun, albeit a lot of work and a lot of really interesting research. But it's certainly created value in my life. I think about my own resilience in a completely different way. And I try and make contributions to everything in any given day, week or period. And, and that in itself, hopefully, is enough for me. Well, from my perspective, working with you three, Dan's self-published a book before, but you were essentially first timers and you all handled it so professionally and was such a pleasure to work with for that. So and the book, it reflects that as well, the quality of the product, which readers will get to enjoy. The Resilient Shield is in Australian and New Zealand physical bookstores now, online as well, Booktopia, Amazon, you can order a print copy online to be delivered to you. And it's available worldwide in ebook and audiobook form. And we were just talking about the audiobook there. It does feature all three of your dulcet tones. Dan, did you enjoy going back to the studio for that? Yeah, I really did. I, I loved that process. I, as you said, I self-published the, the other book and I recorded that one, found that to be good fun. This time around, the, the team was... Uh, was excellent. It was a, a seamless process and, and uh, fantastic to be able to hand it off to someone to edit up. I ended up listening to the other book about six or eight times, which was horrible. It was like we talk about, uh, I think Ben talks in the book about having a, a repeated song playing during resistance to interrogation. I, I, I think it was akin to that, having to listen to my own voice on the last. But yeah, so great process, worked with a, a good team there and can't wait to hear the finished product. Well, gents, it's always a pleasure to chat on mic with you guys, and it's been such a professionally rewarding experience being involved in your book. So thank you for the laughs, for the eye rolls, the hard work, and for coming on the show today. Thanks, Alex. Cheers, Alex. Cheers, Alex. Thanks, mate. Grab your print copy of The Resilient Shield today in Australia and New Zealand from wherever you get your books, and anyone worldwide listening can buy us an ebook and audio form now. For more podcasts with Dr. Dan Pronk, you can listen to his original two-part conversation in Season 2 with Sharon Maskell-Dare in Number 31, Dr. Dan Pronk, Volume 1. Certainly I'd been part of medical teams that had lost people in the past, but it was always in a hospital environment, and it still hits home to a degree, but it was just a whole different level when it's someone you know, someone who you've had breakfast with you know, the day before, and also when you're the one everyone's looking to as the person who's going to save this situation and, and you simply can't. And volume two. I knew that at some point I was going to need to deal with all the events that had happened leading up to there. I knew that I would go from that fast paced life to a, a much slower paced life. Dan came back on the show later that year in the episode Voodoo Medics with Mark Donaldson VC, Dr. Dan Pronk and Kristen Shorten. They quite often dealt with patching up the enemy. They quite often dealt with patching up the civilian population as well. Having this misconception that every veteran, and particularly every combat veteran, is damaged and all of them are, are coming apart with post-traumatic stress. They've got their mates' lives in their hands. They're also required to fight. They're under a lot of pressure and they carry a lot of responsibility. And Dan came back in Season 3 for the bonus episode, Lessons of a Combat Doctor with Dr. Dan Pronk. But I never had any doubt or second guessing. So mentally that was like, hang on, I got this. Yeah, I'm, I'm injured, everyone's injured, I'm losing weight, everyone's losing weight. We're all broken, we're all sleep deprived, food deprived. But it was from then on in, I just, I decided that unless I physically broke to the point where I couldn't go on or they physically removed me from the course, that I was gonna get to the end of it and then just see how the chips fell. He was also featured this year in number 107, Brett Wood. There was that part of him that was just so generous and so giving. He was loyal. He was basically the pinnacle. One of those modern warriors that truly embodied every sense and every letter of that word. Consummate, quite professional. He inspired us. Incredible warrior, incredible leader. And very, very sincere at heart. Ben and Tim made their first appearance on this show in Season 3 in SAS Leadership with Ben Pronk and Tim Curtis. I distinctly remember thinking, I wish I didn't know them quite as well because I knew each of their wives, I knew all of their kids, and I remember thinking, if there is a 50 caliber machine gun on that vessel and it has a, a shot at that helicopter, then not all of us will be coming home. And it was a, quite a, a sort of moving moment. Right at the 11th hour, so just before we were about to launch, we had a call with the Prime Minister who said, go ahead and seize the ship. They returned in Season 4 in SAS Leadership Volume 2 
with Ben Pronk and Tim Curtis. This is the zenith of resilience that you want to aspire to, where you are essentially bulletproof to whatever life throws at you. Guys raced into burning helicopters with detonating explosive charges and ammunition and pulled people out of the wreck. They also appeared in that year's special, Christmas on the Line, Volume 3. East Timor in 1999. It was my very first deployment. I was a young lieutenant platoon commander of reconnaissance sniper platoon in, in two area. It wasn't until I came back that I truly appreciate the value of you know really close friends and family being around you at that important time. And those other episodes I mentioned are in season two, A Journey of Resilience with Matt Williams. Mentally keeping yourself stable is incredibly hard. And I've had times when I've 100% felt myself slipping. In season four, Willie beating cancer, OAM. As an infantryman, I bleed green and I bleed grunt. And if I can't shoot, can't drive, can't deploy, that's my career. That's where it lies for me. And in season five, number 103, Monica Georgieva. A directing staff approached me and he said, Candidate 3, do you know where you are? And I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, you've walked so far north that you're actually outside of the exercise boundary and you haven't hit a checkpoint. So none of that is going to count towards your overall nav. And follow at Dan Pronk and at Resilient Shield on Instagram for more. We're on line two at Life on the Line podcast on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, at L-O-T-L pod on Twitter and at Thistle Productions on LinkedIn. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget.